Hello, and welcome to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm Egan from Caravan Digital. We're an e-commerce digital marketing agency. Today, I'm excited to have on Andrew Maff of Blue Tusker. He's a fellow e-commerce agency owner. Andrew, welcome. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, Andrew Maff, last name Maffetone, usually gets butchered, so I just stick to Maff. <laughs> uh, I'm the founder CEO of Blue Tusker. We're a full-service digital marketing company for e-commerce sellers. Uh, we focus pretty much on an omni-channel approach, working with sellers that are selling across multiple channels in different marketplaces. Um, <clears throat> decent sized team, about four or five of us, I guess. Smaller, but we're getting there. Uh, been around for a few years. Uh, prior to that, I was at a, another e-commerce agency that a partner and I uh, ended up exiting. Um, and now I'm here talking to you. That's great. All right. Well, we're of at least similar agency size. You've been doing this a little, uh, quite a bit longer than I have, so I'm excited to learn from you here. Sounds like you guys are really taking an omni-channel approach. You know, it, from what you said, it sounds like you guys are doing some SEO, doing some Google ads, doing some Amazon ads. How do you think about sort of the different channels and how they play together for your clients? Honestly, uh, <laughs> you're starting off with a good question. So, <laughs> so uh, like, it's a, always a very interesting question because we get a lot of people we work with that ask us about like being a specialty agency and like, you know, you can't be a jack of all trades and stuff like that. And what we've realized is that the average customer, their shopping experience is so fluid. I know, I basically, my wife knows nothing about marketing and I love it because I get to watch how she shops and it makes perfect sense every time I watch it. it make, I'm like, oh great, I'm learning. And she'll sometimes she'll get an ad on Instagram, she'll go to their website and then she'll be like, ooh, this looks great, I want it sooner. So then she'll leave and go to Amazon. Or she'll go to Amazon, see something she likes, but isn't really sure about the brand. So she'll start Googling them to see if they exist. So the average consumer is just all over the place. And what we talked about is having a specialty agency, while it makes a lot of sense and there's, you know, there's justification behind it, the problem is, is if you're a SEO specific agency and you're focused on driving a ton of traffic to the website organically and creating content and getting traffic there, but you're not, you don't have anyone internally that's focused on UI UX or anyone that's focused on any type of conversion rate optimization, you're driving all this traffic. And if you're failing, it's your fault to, according to the client, because you, you're the one driving all the traffic, but you're just driving bad traffic when it could be good traffic, but it's the site problem. The same concept goes for every single channel that you work with. So if you have Facebook ads and you're driving a ton of traffic and they're not converting, or you're driving Google ads, but you're not overseeing Facebook ads because you don't have a good hand on how you're retargeting them on social, there's so many different gray areas to marketing now, especially after all these different iOS changes and things like that, that if you don't have an understanding of what's going on in every single channel, then your own marketing uh, strategy, if you're specific to something, could fail. So that's why what we did is we decided uh, we were going to bring in specialty people in each department and then basically have more or less like fractional CMOs that are overseeing each of them to make sure the strategy is aligned, but that we can pull certain levers. So if SEO is doing really well, we can start ramping up how much content we're doing. Or if paid ads is doing really well, we can you know direct it towards Facebook or Google or whatever we need to do. So that way I can know that all marketing is working together cohesively as opposed to every like basically what ends up happening which is the e-commerce seller becomes their own account manager and is really just wrangling different agencies at all times so that's more or less why we took this approach i say that omni channel piece so one of the reason you need it is you can see people shopping the old secret of marketers of you know watch your spouse watch how they shop <laughs> they're jumping channel to channel they're using different devices they're doing different things over time and so that's the reality that's how people are finding our clients websites and that's how they're shopping yeah, their spouses. Well, tell me a little bit. I'll start with SEO. Um, you know, we started life as an SEO agency. We're working more with like local clients. We still do a bit of on-site, but, you know, in terms of what do you see working? How has the game changed? I'm just, I'm curious to hear you, you know, the, the big categories that we see once, you know, a site is optimized is kind of, you know, what's going on with content, what's going on with backlinks, and in some cases, you know, what are the technical fixes we need to be, we need to be watching for? 
You know, it's really crazy. I, you know, I mentioned earlier I had I had an agency before, and we did very little SEO. If if you're not including like Amazon SEO, so like listing optimization stuff, and 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 back then, in my opinion, SEO was still very like there was kind of some black hat stuff you can do, and you could really just kind of tweak your way around stuff. And now, you know, Google's gotten so strict with some of the stuff that you you can post and what you can say and how you do it and all these things. And the other side of it is that CPCs from paid advertising has gotten so much more expensive over time or the opposite, which is you have so many different advertising channels that everyone's testing different ones. So over the past couple of years, we've had much more SEO work than I've ever had by a long shot. And I think it's because sellers are starting to see that the, the way I always explain is SEO is an asset. If you decided I'm going to stop optimizing my site and I'm going to stop making articles for my website, you're still going to continue to see, if not a little bit of organic growth, at least it's going to maintain. And then you're going to, whatever you were getting before, you're going to consistently get. Paid advertising, if you go, I don't want to do paid advertising anymore, you turn them off, done, it's gone. Your whole thing gets wiped out clean. So we, we kind of see SEO as an investment, whereas we see paid advertising as kind of like a quick win. So from an SEO perspective, one of the things that was really nice that actually happened to us about a year and a half ago, give or take, is we were working with someone, we were the seller of ours we were working with, and we were doing all their paid advertising, and we wanted to work with them on SEO, and they're like, no, we have someone who's killing it. And we were like, okay, like, great. And then we looked into their SEO, and they were right. Like, there was just guy was getting a hockey stick and we we're like awesome what is he doing that we're not doing and so we were able to get on calls with him and kind of learn from him this is big seo consultant he's been doing it for like 20 years or something like that and every single thing that he was doing was exactly what we were doing with one difference and that's where we learned like okay that's that's the differentiator so essentially not to tease it we do the on-page stuff. Just make sure your site's you know functional. It's it's loading fast, mobile friendly, all that fun stuff. We really focus on all of the main pages of the website to be conversion rate friendly. So don't plow it with a ton of copy. Your product pages don't need to have a ton of copy. Focus on the consumer. The other side of it is the blog. You have to have a blog. Then there's the off-page stuff. You can do some backlinking, reach out to people to try to get, um, you know, you can share backlinks, you can do guest blog posts, all that fun stuff. That kind of keeps things going a little bit more. The one thing we saw, though, that was the biggest differentiator was we usually post like an article a week, give or take. Now what we do is after about 30 to 60 days, depending on, we look at how the article that was written prior to that timeline was doing. And if it's not ranking where we want it to, we start leveraging different software to actually tell us what needs to get adjusted in it. And we go and we adjust them. So every 30 to 60 days, we actually do a refresher for the blog that we did 30 to 60 days prior. And that's where we started to see this big approach. So just to drop exactly what we're using. So we use, we're SEMrush partners, um, but we also have Ahrefs. And the reason we have both, even though they're relatively similar, is because Ahrefs integrates with SEO Surfer. And essentially, SEO Surfer, what we do is we can actually take the article that we wrote along with the top articles that are ranking for the term that we want to rank for. And SEO Surfer will actually tell us you should consider adding X more images. You should consider bullet points here. You should add this much more words. And when we go back and edit that stuff and just throw it into Search Console to get it indexed quicker, it sometimes could take like two weeks and we start to see that start to go up. So as long as that blog post is optimized in other areas to drive traffic over to the product page, whether that's from links or if we have some stuff on the sidebar or a pop-up or anything like that, that's immediately where we start to see that organic growth from traffic and from revenue. Thank you for sharing that. So it sounds like SEO surfers doing some of that analysis that maybe SEOs used to do manually in a very time consuming way to say, hey, here's my blog post. It's not ranking like I'd hope. You know, what what do they got that we don't got in terms of the competitors? And it's really, it's really helping you identify, hey, here's what you need to change. Here's how you need to re-optimize that old post so it gets some traffic. Is that correct? <laughs> It's, it's speeded up a lot. And the interesting thing is too, that we learn every time we go and do this is that when you're looking at your article versus the other 
you know, whatever else is ranking, the the word count means nothing. Like there's been times where they'll have three, 4,000 words and SEO Surfer will be like, you only need like two, you'll be fine. Because of just, it knows like how fast people are scrolling through some of this stuff. And it starts to teach itself after a while. It's got this whole AI aspect to it. Um, it's it's pretty impressive. There, I mean, there's still stuff that like you got to dig into, like what topics should you be writing about based on your audience. There's the art of it that is is very different. But when it comes down to the science of just knowing, okay, I need to come up with X amount more copy or I need to add another section to this, that's where SEO Server has really helped us kind of uh, speed that process up. That's awesome. Andrew, would you be willing to pull it up and show us that process? I I have, um, we actually just brought on an SEO specialist and I have a content marketer we work with now who is overseeing all of this. So I gotta see if I can even get in here. Um, so here's the article that we wrote and it gives us a content score here. Uh, we can map out like an outline if we need to or a brief, which kind of helps when we send it over to the clients, but it'll actually give us certain terms on how many we're using versus how many we should be using based on who it, what we're trying to rank for. So in this case, it's pretty much telling us, you know, we might want to add some more of these in here. This is a brand new article, so it doesn't have a lot of the content, uh, a lot of the data behind it just yet. And this is actually brand new. So I hope my team doesn't get mad at me for showing this. <laughs> We're going to find out. Um, but yeah, so this is, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it shows you like, all right, based on the term you're trying to target, this is approximately how many words you need. This is how many headings you need, how many images you should probably have, paragraphs. So we can kind of break down the whole concept just by what we're trying to target for this one, which is best crypto mining calculators. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So this is, this is, uh, I'll say, platform agnostic in terms of if you're on Shopify, if you're on WordPress, if you're on whatever, you can use this versus if we're on... If we're looking for WordPress Yoast, we have to be on WordPress. So this is this is a solution if we're not on WordPress. Is that fair to say? Correct. Yeah. You, it doesn't matter what you're on. We actually just, this article, we just take directly out of usually like a Google Doc or something, drop it in here and start doing the research behind it. Yeah, that's awesome. And so it's is it pulling data, you say, from Search Console and also what what's going on at actual Google result page in terms of competing blog posts? Yeah, so essentially this has, man, I hope one of the surfer refs isn't listening to me and I'm wrong about this, but it's just, I know it's pulling data from different, like, so it's got all your SERP analysis, analysis in here. It's pulling data, I believe, out of Google Search Console. Well, no, I know it's pulling data out of Google Search Console because it's ranking our own article. I gotcha. Well, those other keywords, can you show that again for a second? So with that post, um, like all those keywords you showed on the right, did your team enter those or you just entered the main calculator one and it gave you all the others? Yeah, we we just put the article in here. And then in here, it tells us essentially how many times we're using a certain word versus how many times we need to or if we need to use it less. So in this case, we used it four to 10 times. It needs to be used four to 10 times, but we used it 11 times. So it actually thinks we need to pull back how many times we're using this. So it'll basically turn green if we're right in the area, yellow if we got to add a couple more or something like that. But all the red stuff is basically telling us like, hey, you're using that word too many times. Yeah, like very specific. Here's here's related keywords we want to be using. Here's the frequency. Here's kind of the idea around that. That's awesome. Um, what kind of results have you guys seen You know, since you've been using this? This case study was done for the year of 2020, uh, 2021 over 2020. And I actually looked at it again the other day uh, and their their organic traffic was up, I want to say like 35% just in the first quarter. And then their, what we're more obviously more focused on is for them, they, they take on leads, even though they're e-commerce, they still take on leads because it's B2B. Um, and their organic lead flow maintained the same percentage. Because that's, that's the one thing we always want to focus on is, hey, your traffic is great. But if it's not converting, who cares? Like then it's just a vanity metric. So the one thing we try to make sure is that they're still seeing increased or uh, increased um, lead flow or increased uh, purchases. Yeah, and I see here even on this what you have written up from this time frame of thirty percent increased organic conversions year over year. Do you guys see that? Are people then reading this organic content, clicking over to product pages and buying? Is that what's happening? Um. 
Sometimes. So there's a few different ways, right? So you think about you have that basic way, right? Which is they reading the article, they see a link, they click it, it happens to be the product they convert. But there's a lot of other like bells and whistles that we always suggest adding. Like if you're doing stuff on a sidebar, is there any kind of gated content you can have that'll speed up this process? Or if you need a pop-up or something along those lines. One of the things we started implementing as well, um, what we started doing was in the article post, which sometimes these newer ones, we haven't gotten in here and added them yet. But we've actually started adding our own display ads. Kind of, I guess you can refer to it as a display ad. So like in this case, yeah, like this. So this one's a little odd because this company is working closely with this other company and they're sharing stuff. But this is just an internal display ad that we added to break up the copy because you want to add more images anyway. So what we started doing is adding in like, you know, something here every now and then we'll throw one in the middle. Sometimes it's very vague because it'll just be, you know, hey, check out this collection of stuff. And other times it'll be really specific. We're HubSpot partners. So one of the things we can do like this is even though this is an image, this is actually in HubSpot. It's considered just a CTA and you can change out the image. So if I go into HubSpot and change out this image, it'll change it everywhere that it is. So if I want to do a promo one month, I can actually change all of my ads that are in my blog posts. And that way, if I'm doing a sale or anything, they'll see all that organic traffic will come in. So I don't have to always bother them with a pop up. Yeah, that's great. I love this tip. This is very cool. Can I ask, um, you know, in terms of how you're doing this with your team, you know, um, are you having to find writers? Are the writers having to sort of interview your, your clients to become subject matter expertise? How do you source the writers? How do you create the content? How do you get the people to do the work? Finding a writer for every single type of product line or company is a nightmare and arguably impossible, especially if like the company I just showed you, Staiku, they sell 3D body scanners uh, to gyms. I think there's like four competitors. So to find someone that has that background is not a thing. Um, so before we start doing anything, we always create a brand voice guideline along with a customer profile which essentially we'll dig into their Google Analytics, we'll dig into any past data, the Shopify, we'll dig into all their customer data we can get. We'll basically dig in and paint a picture of who is their ideal customer, but just one person. Like usually you'll have like people with multiple customers, but we really try to generalize it a little bit more. And then we write a brand voice guideline, which is essentially that target person that we came up with, how do we want to speak to them? Like, what is that person going to resonate with? So once we kind of create those things, we send them over to uh, whoever we're working with and kind of make sure we're all on the same page. That way we know exactly how we want everything to sound. And then from there, our writers, you know, we'll set up different ways for them to start doing research. Luckily, a lot of these software platforms they start to help when you put stuff into place and goes, you want to add more of these words and you go, all right, what does that word mean? And then you look it up and they actually learn that way. So even surfer has helped a little bit there. Um, like we have right now from an SEO standpoint, I think we're probably working with about maybe 20 or 30 different clients right now. And I would, I think we have like six writers and each of them, it really kind of comes down to, they have, a certain tone that no matter what brand voice guideline I give them, I can always tell it's going to come out a certain way. Plus there's things that I know they enjoy writing about. That's what I try to focus on just because they have a background somewhere. doesn't mean they like it. And if they enjoy writing it, it always comes out better. In terms of the ongoing SEO work, how do you think about it? How do you guys balance, you know, like, is it mostly content writing? Is there some sort of technical piece to make sure sites are fast enough? And then link building, we haven't talked about yet, but I always just like to ask, are you are you guys doing a lot with client link building? And if so, kind of what tactics and strategies do you like to employ there? Yeah, so we're doing, obviously the content updates are from the SEO surfer side, mostly what we're doing. We usually do it pretty much monthly where we review all the articles that were written the month or two prior and see how they're doing. Um, and then we'll pull reporting on basically like, okay, here's like our top, I don't know, let's say a hundred terms. 
here's the page that's currently ranking the highest, here's where it's ranking, and then we look at how we can improve that page month over month to make sure that the ranking is continuing to climb. Um, from an on-page standpoint, so from a technical side, you'd be shocked at, well, you wouldn't be, you would know, but your, your listeners may be shocked at how often stuff breaks on your site, <laughs> like consistently. Like we might be editing and adding new articles and stuff, but you other there, people are always adding stuff to their site. They're always adjusting things. Um, links could randomly break even in Shopify. Sometimes an app will update and it'll break something. You don't know about it. And so getting a lot of that information, a lot of that we get through SEMrush, which it will update us with a site audit every, I think like two weeks or something when it tells us like what's broken and what's not. Some of it is just basic stuff like front, uh, front facing stuff. So like broken links or anything like that. Some of it could be Google has now indexed you like, I guess, deeper than it has before, but it's now finding errors that we didn't know about before. Then there's the technical stuff. So you have, you got to make sure obviously mobile friendly that's been beaten to death for the past like five or six years. Um, site speed is obviously a very big thing right now, which that kind of, it'll walk you through some of the technical aspects that my developer would know better than I would, but like how your page loads. So if it's that way, it is obviously loading faster. Um, trying to think what else they're approaching meta titles meta descriptions all that fun stuff gets re reapproached too um but a lot of it comes down to like back-end code and loading that that tends to get slow which obviously causes issue not only for seo but for anything that you're driving traffic to sure yeah what is the what's the pie graph look like for your team in terms of this much time on content this much time on technical and on page and then this much time on backlinks like how do you guys break that up I have um, at least one person in each of those fields, I guess we'll call it. So while I have about six writers, we then have an editor that looks at everything b before it gets turned over. Then we have a content marketing manager that oversees all of that stuff getting published at the right time and things like that. That's just, and, and she's overseeing how often we're doing edits um, to uh, for the SEO surfer side. So that whole aspect is managed more or less from a copywriter slash content manager. Then I have someone who solely focuses on the on-page SEO. And I have someone who solely focuses on off-page SEO. And I have someone who's overseeing both of those people right now. In, t in terms of off-page, is that is that a link building piece? Is that an area you guys get into and focus on? We do a lot of it. Uh, it's, I think it's definitely necessary. Sometimes we have conversations with, you know, once your site gets to a certain domain authority, you can only speed it up so much. Um, you know, so the off page side, you can then pivot the way that you're approaching it. So when we're doing off page, like, let's say your, let's say your domain authority is like a 30. Usually what will happen is we'll sit down, we'll talk with the off page team and we'll kind of tell them like, all right, anything like a 25 and lower, we don't want to bother with. Um, anything that's much higher, we're willing to work with as much as we can. So as your site gets higher and higher up as a domain authority, the amount of websites you have to work with gets smaller and smaller. And if they're that big, the amount that they're willing to work with you gets smaller and smaller. So either you're not getting that many links or they want to charge you for it, which I almost never do. Um, so she'll spend a lot of her time scraping who's going to work who you know who would be good to target then it's starting the conversation of uh we think that we think we have an article that would be a good link here right that's super basic or we have a link for an article that would go good here and we're willing to give a backlink to you right so we're now link sharing the other option which is improving their articles which sometimes we do this sometimes for the really big ones which is we'll actually download their entire article. Like we'll just copy and paste it into a Google doc, drop it into SEO surfer and show them. You could actually rank this article better with an additional paragraph here. We wrote the paragraph for you. Here's the paragraph, our links in it. <laughs> and so they go, oh, this is great. And they just drop it in there. And then not only is their article ranking better, but we got the backlink. The bigger companies with the bigger domain authorities, they love that stuff. Outside of that, they just want to charge you. Uh, and then you have guest post opportunities. Yeah, Andrew, that's a great tip. That's, I, I have not heard that one before. That's fantastic.
it's a it's an interesting workload. It's not something that we usually suggest doing. And honestly, it's not something that we bother doing if it's like someone who's just a little bit bigger of a domain authority. Because you got to think like, you got to copy and paste the whole thing. You got to throw it in an SEO surfer. You got to see what else it needs, if it needs anything. You got to see which terms it needs. Then we got to send it over to a copywriter to give to write the art, uh, the extra paragraph. Then we got to make sure that we have an article that's relevant for it. Then we have to send it over to them and just hope. So that's why it's kind of like it's really worth it for the bigger domain authority companies that like their websites that like don't want to deal with constant backlink sharing. But if you are showing them data, like your article can be fixed with what I just put in this email, it will take you five seconds. They'll be like, cool, copy and paste, they throw it up. That's great. I think the challenge is always, how do we make link building win-win? And I think historically people have kind of followed, you know, Brian Dane back, Linko and other tactics and sort of, hey, we've got a link asset here. Would you, you know, would you mind linking to us? Your readers might appreciate it. But in this case, you're saying, here's how you make your blog post better. And the tit for tat is, and you know, there's a link to us. I think that's great. That's, that's, we're back in win-win territory. So I love to hear that. And it, it certainly makes sense of those, you know, domain authority, you know, every, what is it, decile, you know, that's, what is that, 10x? Like, it's 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 a big deal. It's not like going 30 to 40, going 40 to 50, going 50 to 60. Like, it's like the Richter scale. That's a logarithmic scale. That's a really big deal. So it can be worth putting in some extra work to pitch those higher domain authority domains. I agree. Love it. Okay, one thing, I'll let you go here soon, but I would be remiss not to ask you about, how do you think about how Amazon plays with the client website? And talk to us a little bit about your, your idea of the fluidity around that. I told you earlier, I watch my wife, how she shops, right? And so I'll watch her go to a website and then go to Amazon. And I go, for someone who's not comfortable with the brand yet, if they're going to do that anyway, why not make sure that their experience is comfortable the whole time? Because when she goes to Amazon to try to find the product, she's now also seeing all of their competitors. So obviously, if you send them to a listing you're still going to see it or you could build out your storefront where it's each a product page, which becomes a nightmare, but it's an option. But what I've always said is why not add an available on Amazon button on the website that takes you directly to either the product listing or the product page on the storefront where you can get rid of all your competition. Some sellers love it. Some sellers hate it <laughs> for a lot of obvious reasons. The ones that are really focused on Amazon and do most of their business on Amazon, they love the idea the uh, sellers that are trying to really hold on to their profit margin hate it. Um, about, I think it was about two years ago, uh, Amazon finally started to accept that if you drive traffic to Amazon, you can use their affiliate program and basically more or less be double dipping where you can get some of your percentage back for driving off pay off Amazon traffic. They used to hate it because they thought that you were trying to rob the affiliate program. But when they realized the guys that were doing this are just driving more and more traffic to Amazon, they started to allow it. Well, just about a week ago, and this was like, you ever have like one of those moments where you're like, ah, oh, man, I, I knew it. I knew it. Amazon about a week ago, and it's killing me. I forgot the name of it. It's called like buy, buy with Prime or something, buy buy prime button or something and so basically buy with prime so essentially what is happening is amazon has now created their own button because we used to just custom make them we used to just make an image and just link it and we'd put a google tag in it and track how many people clicked it and all that fun stuff but now google has actually taken a javascript code of their own button that you can put on your shopify site that will take you directly to your product listing so it must have been working uh, so it's really interesting. I really like it for certain aspects, especially if you're a newer brand, because it's so hard. It's, it, I've worked with sellers before that can do seven, eight, nine figures on Amazon and then start their own Shopify site and not get sales within the first month and panic and go, this doesn't work. And they don't realize like you're really almost starting from scratch. So to kind of leverage the brand awareness that Amazon obviously has and to be able to take people to a place where you already have a ton of reviews, allowing them to do that at least for a little while is great. Obviously, you want to add all of your different incentives on the site to keep them there. 
do your 10% off or whatever for your first order or something, have, you know, maybe better incentives for subscribe and save or whatever, you have points on your site, like, you know, um, purchasing points and all that stuff, rewards, anything you can do to keep them on the site is obviously the best way to go. However, if you can allow them to enjoy the experience and go wherever they're most comfortable, we've worked with sellers that did Walmart buttons and eBay buttons. They don't care as long as the customer shops with them and doesn't go to a competitor. So allowing them to do that for at least a little while until you've built up your site enough and then take those buttons away and just test like how much are you going to lose on your site has I've seen it work wonders on some sites. Pretty interesting. I like that. No one's no one's ever mentioned that tactic and glad to hear you were right. It's always fun to celebrate a little bit. It's like I knew it. This is a, this is a way to do it. That's good. Now, Andrew, you mentioned, you know, uh, B2B clients a little bit. Um you know, before you before you hop off here, tell us a little bit about you know who's a good fit for you guys and uh, you know where they should check you out. Yeah, um, so bluetusker.com is the easiest way to go, or just any social media channel. We're at Blue Tusker. Uh, there's no e in Tusker, so it's B L U E T U S K R. Um, we honestly we do have a good amount of B2B e-commerce clients. I don't know how it happened; it just so happened. I think probably we're HubSpot partners, so we've we've gotten some stuff from them. Um, we do obviously just probably just as much D to C. Uh, it's just, I haven't had this many B2B clients in a long time. So it was interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, otherwise we're, we're all over the place. So, uh, we do a lot with Shopify, a lot with Amazon and a lot with HubSpot. Love it. All right. We're gonna have to have you come on again sometime when you want to talk Amazon ads. How's that sound? I can do that. Have a great one. Thank you for sharing what's working in e-commerce. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Thank you. Thank you.